Now that's uh, that's ash from Mount St. Helens. It's called the, the Set S Tephra. And it's sandwiched. You see, these are flood layers. These are back floods, giant back flood, sediment-laden back floods that washed up into the Yakima Valley uh, and then flowed back out. And at the deposition of this layer here, right following the deposition of this layer and prior to the deposition of this layer above it, there was a huge mass of volcanic ash that was settled down. Now, the question is, was this rhythmite layer here, this sedimentary layer, when the ash settled on it, was it, was it underwater or was it exposed to the atmosphere? That's the question. If it was underwater, then it would imply that there was probably really a lot of ash that fell that then had to settle through the water column and then settle out. But I, I'm looking at this, I'm going, what you've got here is these are back flood sediments. So these actually occurred, uh, let me move this out of the way. Let's see, uh, flood rhythmites on the south bank of the Yakima River near Mabton, Washington. Okay, so this is very close to the limit of the back floods. So this is going to be a fairly low energy depositional environment. You're, in other words, what you got to picture is that there's a main valley in this flood, sediment-laden flood is rushing down through this valley, but there's tributaries coming into the valley. So as the main flood comes down the trunk uh, channel, it will back flood up into the tributaries. And that back flooding will reach uh, an elevation roughly equivalent with the highest peak level of the flood within the main trunk valley, if that makes sense. Once the water level in the main trunk valley begins to drop, then the water in the, in the tributary valleys reverses and drains back out. And when it does, it leaves sediment behind. Because again, sediment, the sediment load is being, is dependent upon how fast the water is moving. If the water is moving fast, it can pick up and entrain a lot of, in this case, fine grain sediment. And then as the water slows down, that, that stuff begins to settle out. So what you've got here is very close to the area where the current did this reversal. This is not there, but it's very close to that point. So you're getting a low energy depositional environment here. And uh, part of the question in my mind is how uh, much time elapsed. And this is a critical question that we have to come back to over and over again in discussing the genesis of these great floods is that how much time lapsed between deposition of each rhythmical layer. Critical question. Are we talking about years? Are we talking about days? Are we talking about hours? I will say this, that as far as the current dominant models of these floods, there would be years between each deposition of each layer, perhaps 30, 50 to 100 years. And that is uh, an assumption that follows from the current models of flood origin, which requires repeated damming of the Clark Fork River in the area of Lake Pend Oreille in the Northern Panhandle of Idaho. So then you have to go and ask the question, how much time elapses between failure of each dam and then restoration of the dam, allowing the lake to refill. And the minimum amount of time is 30 to 50 years. That's the minimum. So the assumption is, is that each rhythmite represents a separate flood. And I am extremely skeptical of that idea. But within that framework of thinking, then each of these rhythmites, if each of these layers represents a distinct flood, each and each one of those di distinct floods requires a separate filling and draining of Lake Missoula over east in western Montana, then you're saying that somewhere between 30 and 100 years elapsed between deposition of each of these layers. Now, my question would be, and we're going to come back to this as we really begin to break down these, these the, the, the science and, and research about the mega floods, is this. If you've got 50 years, 50 years is enough time for a whole, you know, pine forests to become replenished. You know, you're not going to have full 200 foot trees, but you're going to have a lot of vegetation growth in 50 years. In 100 years, I mean, yeah, you're going to have 100 foot tall trees there. So you ought to see that in the deposition. Where is it? W yeah, where is the, 
Yeah. I would argue that there's much, much closer in time between the depositions of these layers. Isn't this in the western extent of Lake Lewis? Yes, this is the western extent of Lake Lewis. Yes, so these would be the same kind of pulsing uh, rhythmites that would match on the other side of Burlingame Canyon. That's exactly right. On the other side of Burlingame Canyon is a whole another set of rhythmites. And I will go ahead and we'll take a look here since we're here. The, the Mount St. Helens layer over there also. Here we go. Check this out. This is the this ash. is it. Yes. Now you can't see from this photograph that I we took in 1998. Let's see. The Mount St. Helens tephra is in here, but you can't really see it in this photograph. What you can see in this photograph is interesting, though. You'll notice that the layers at the bottom are much thicker, and they, mm -hmm. they begin to thin out as you go up. Uh, also, at the top, you've got this roughly six-foot-thick layer of lus, which is a completely different material. This is an airborne. This is a material that's settled out of the atmosphere. Each one of these layers represents, a, if you will, a type of a, ba a backwash, a sediment-laden backwash. You see, now this is on, yeah, as Brad was saying, this is on the easternmost extent of ancient Lake Lewis, the temporary ponding above Wallula Gap, and uh, Mabton is on the other side. But we're going to be getting into this in much more detail and looking at maps and everything so people can get the, get the, get the picture. Yeah, here's, here, here we see another version of a lot of erosion on it, so they're not quite as distinct as you see. Here, this is this is the Burlingame Gully. What happened was, was it in the 1930s? I think it was an irrigation pipe that broke, and for about a week or two, this enormous amount of water under high pressure gushed out, gushed out of this pipe and cut this canyon here. Well, nobody was really expecting that what was going to be exposed under the ground was all of these rhythmical layers, suggesting that the whole you see this basin as far as you see to these hills on the horizon is part of this Pasco Basin. And so the whole bottom of Pasco Basin is covered in these rhythmical layers. Wait a minute. A farmer cut that canyon? <laughs> well, no, it was probably, let's see, when, I don't know who, who I don't know if the, if the irrigation pipe was private or government. I don't know. That's incredible. Yeah, I, it was I would a never have... irrigation pipe. Yeah, yeah. there's something similar in South Georgia. I don't. You you guys live in yeah, Columbus, Pro Providence, Providence Canyon. Canyon. Yeah, yes. that, yeah. that, that is. Was... Well, I mean that's natural though, in the sense oh, okay. that once once they see once they started plowing the fields, you know, you remove the vegetation, and now you get a lot more uh, surface wash and, and a lot more erosion. That's what happened in Providence Canyon. Once agriculture started in the late 19, 1800s, that's when the accelerated erosion began. Here, wow. it was just a short-lived event that was probably just like three or four days before they well, got the pipe repaired. But in the interim, it has sliced this canyon here, this, this gully, which exposed these rhythmical layers. Now, this is the, on the other side over up in, the, up in the Yakima Valley. But the interesting thing is that these layers here are going to correspond, correspond with these layers here. Now, it was in these layers where we could – no, it wasn't in these either. Um, we actually, yeah, we're, it took us a while to find that outcrop, but, um, it was uh, like it said up in Mabton, this is down next to the Yakima river. So these rhythmites here have been exposed by modern river erosion and have been exposed to the atmosphere a lot longer than, than these. So these are still relatively pristine. Now the question is, how much time elapsed between between the depth? There's roughly 40 layers here. So the assumption has been that each one of those layers represents a distinct flood. And each flood represents a distinct damming of Lake Missoula, which means that you have to go through and think through the whole process of how, um, how glacier ice could dam and create and then recreate and then recreate again a body of water with five to 600 cubic miles in it that's 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 backed up behind an ice dam you know as much as 2000 or more feet deep this is an interesting and very to me very very sticky problem it's we're going to really get in and look at that because i it's my personal opinion that that model 
is pretty much doesn't make sense anymore for theoretical reasons and empirical reasons. For example, right here is an empirical reason. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, a vertical dike through the, the whole sedimentary column here. Now, if that dike, you know, cuts through, it, it is more than just a surface feature. You can think of it this way. If you have layers of mud after a flood, you've noticed, everybody's noticed how you get mud cracks, right? Okay, well, if you look at it, you can see that even on, even on a, mic, uh, a small scale, you will see multiple layers of mud. And if they're all deposited within one event, not necessarily all exactly at the same time, but within one event, as they dry out together, they will form these, these vertical dikes that will cut through the entire rhythmical, even if it's only an inch or six inches thick. <clears throat> so this thing here to me is a very suspicious uh, clue that would suggest that the, that the uh, dewatering of this sedimentary column was taking place, not over multiple individual events, but these might have been deposited as surges within a single flood. But we'll get back to that because, you know, how many floods were there? The original idea was that there was one big flood. Now, according to some studies, there's as many as 90 separate floods. After the study of this and the assumption by uh, the geologists who are looking at this, who, who assumed or concluded that each layer represents a unique flood, then what that does is they now built a chronology upon that based upon the duration between each de the deposition of each layer. So in other words, you have a layer, okay? The layer represents a failure of the ice dam. Then you have to reseal the valley and refill the lake. How long does that take? Well, this is where you get 30 to 100 years. So if you then assume you've got 40 discrete layers, each one is a different flood. Each flood requires the whole cycle to happen. Now you're looking at 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years for deposition of the entire sedimentary column here. And that's now kind of the working assumption. And it's been buttressed by some optically stimulated luminescent dating um, and some geomagnetic data. However, I and, and we get into this. I have reason to to question the accuracy of 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 that those dates applied to these events, because there's a lot of other evidence that would mitigate against that. Because again, if you had let's say forty or fifty years transpiring between each event, well, you should expect that there should be some pretty mature, a pretty mature biome there. There should be shrubs or grasses or, or small trees, something like that, that would be preserved between each successive layer. Do we see that? I think the answer is no, we don't really see that. But again, we'll come back to all of this. This is, this is coming up in the near future. <laughs>